My name is Oksana Chelyshova. I'm, I'm a Russian journalist. Uh, for the last five years I've been living and working in Finland uh, because of tough political reality of, of Russia nowadays. And uh, this is, it turned out to be the only way for me uh, to continue to work independently and to escape some, some dangers. I've been uh, working with uh, quite a number of Finnish organizations, including Finnish Pen Center and uh, um, Union of Journalists. I'm a member now of uh, Union of Journalists of Finland. The problem of my situation is that uh, I, I can't visit my home country, so I haven't, I haven't been there uh, since uh, the day when I made that decision to uh, to stay in Finland. It was in uh, March 2008. But at the same time, Finland has uh, um, provided me with a lot more possibilities uh, to uh, um, work on uh, cases of politically uh, persecuted people in Russia, uh, to draw attention to their cases and to their fates uh, from international community and uh, in some occasions to organize uh, some real um, help to them. So, and uh, in this respect, um, I am content with, uh, uh, with my life, although it's pretty tough, uh, to be honest, to, uh, to have uh, to have this kind of experience and uh, um, that's the reason why, for instance, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't advise anybody else uh, to, uh, to follow my path. The reasons uh, for this uh, troubling situation are uh, I, I've had since 2005 are very complex. Uh, it's not just one accident or a couple of accidents which uh, motivated me to take this decision. Actually, mostly it was because of my work as a journalist um, on, on Chechnya, uh, because I, I used to work as uh, the editor of the uh, Russian Chechen Information Agency, which was established by the Russian Friendship Chechen Society, an NGO. And uh, we had a network of our reporters in uh, Chechnya and in Gushetia, and the, uh, the agency worked since 2000 until 2006, uh, when actually we, the organization as such was banned as extremist uh, by the Russian court. But the personal problem started even before that, and um, one of the explanations to that is as I can see it now, was uh, our attempt to mediate, um, mediate with, uh, uh, to mediate during the Bislan uh, crisis when uh, the school was taken hostage in a small town of Bislan in North City on uh, September the first, two thousand four. It happened so that uh, I. Uh, personally reached uh, uh, on phone um, some leaders of the Chechen separatist movement, those who were moderate uh, and reasonable and uh, with whom it was possible to communicate. And already on the September the 1st, 2004, uh, these people condemned the act of terrorism. And uh, it uh, helped to start political talks which were held between some leaders of uh, North Caucasian republics, including North Ossetia and Ingushetia. And uh, by morning of September the 3rd, uh, we learned that some political decision had been taken, and the uh, uh, then president of uh, uh, Chechnya, Mas Aslan Maschadov, who was still legitimate at that time, but who was underground. So he made the decision to join the rescue headquarters and uh, to become part of the rescue headquarters. So uh, he was ready to, literally speaking, he was ready uh, to 
start acting on the so-called Russian side to save the children. But storming of the school started uh, a few hours after that, and uh, so children children die mostly in fire. Uh, but I I was when I was um, when I initiated that uh, phone conversation with uh, those people. And it was my first attempt ever to reach representatives of, uh, of the uh, of so-called rebels, um, because uh, before that uh, we had uh, we had tried to adhere to the uh, norm that we remain independent journalists. We just report the facts, and uh, we didn't ever uh, try to ask for comments from either side of the conflict, either from the Chechen side of the conflict or from the Russian state side of the conflict. So we just reported the facts and uh, uh, without any comments. But it was the first time when I decided to do that, um, and there was one particular reason. I realized that uh, it wouldn't be possible for me to remain uh, to consider myself a journalist if I would wait until the crisis is settled in a violent way and uh, we should and we would start counting the dead bodies once again. So if the massacre had any single chance to be prevented, so we should have tried to use this chance. So that's I am never, even now, despite all the consequences to that decision, uh, I've never regretted uh, having made that attempt. And later, and later I learned that um, actually it was also the attempt which Anna Politkovska made a few hours before me, but um, it resulted in nothing because uh, uh, she was on the way to Bislan when she was poisoned. And it was one of the first attempts at her life. But uh, soon after uh, this mediation and uh, this uh, successful, successful result in getting condemnation of terrorism as such and that particular act of terrorism from such people as uh, Aslan Maschadov and, uh, 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 and his representatives abroad, um, actually, we came under pressure <laughs> from, from the authorities and it all started via official media. We, uh, they, uh, almost immediately after that, uh, articles appeared about us being uh, friends of terrorists. And uh, then uh, uh, I started to receive death threats, uh, not just once. And uh, they were not phone calls or nothing like that. So they were flyers, death flyers. And the death flies were disseminated in hundreds in the area where I live, in Nizhny Novgorod. And uh, uh, the death flies provided people with my real address, where my family lived and still lives. And uh, people were called to fight on me as I was uh, uh, represented as an enemy of Russia and an enemy of the Russian people. But that attempt also failed because, um, and for me, it was a very positive sign of uh, uh, normal Russia uh, having future, because uh, I also I I, I um, also there were several attempts to disseminate those death flyers with my personal address, so they were they were no single nasty glance at my neighbors. On the contrary, people. Uh, people brought those death flies, which they found in their mailboxes, to my flat. They knocked and they rang the bell of my door, and they expressed indignation not with me, but with those people who organized the death flies. And uh, for some time, uh, when I was uh, on the way home, uh, my neighbors, people who I actually didn't know personally, they stopped me and they told Oksana, it's uh, already dark and we are concerned about you, you you shouldn't walk alone, take care of yourself. So people remained on my side, to be honest. But it 
while it continued and uh, they were uh, finally the organization was banned as extremist and uh, my uh, our office was searched many times and uh, uh, in 2007 uh, we tried to organize a small, very small event to commemora commemorate our friend and colleague Anna Politkovska, and they didn't even let um, to hold this event. They broke, uh, they had broken into our office, they arrested our foreign guests, by the way, also from Catalonia. Yes, they were people from, uh, they were two people you know, who came to visit us uh, for that occasion. Uh, from uh, uh, from Manresa, and uh, they they were also arrested, and uh, uh, so it was yeah it was a really nonsense, but it happened in the course of time as we didn't cease our activities, and uh, as uh, the FSB and the uh, state agencies failed to break uh, our will. Uh, so I continued to receive threats and be under pressure and then in 2008 when I came to Finland with a very short visit, um, on the last day of my visit to Finland when I had the train, uh, the ticket for the train back to Moscow and then to Nizhny Novgorod, I got a phone call that morning uh, from my colleagues, from journalists and uh, who didn't work with us. And they told that uh, uh, police was searching our office was ag once again, and that everything was confiscated, <gasps> and there uh, more than twenty flats of people, not in Nizhny Novgorod but also in the region, who were considered to be linked with us, were also raided. And at that time, we were working on uh, the legal research into the international law, and we were in the middle of this process, and. Uh, all the work was halted because everything was confiscated and we lost all computers and everything. My first decision was just to take the train and go home and to start doing something on that. But then my Finnish friends told her, come on, come down a bit. Just don't you understand what's going on? So you will go uh, back home and uh, so we would have to help you, but you wouldn't be able to do anything there. So I postponed my return to Russia, firstly for one month, then for two months, then for three months. And there I'm still in Finland. I'm not yet a refugee. Um, I was, uh, I've been a writing exile of the Finnish Penn Center. So I had the residence permit in Finland but uh, I, 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 I wasn't a refugee. I'm, st I'm still not a refugee. To continue our work, we, uh, may we moved uh, the legal entity of the organization to Finland. So since 2006, the Russian Chechen Friendship Society has been registered as a Finnish NGO. And it was one of the reasons uh, for my trip to Finland in 2008. So it, it enabled us to continue our work. We finished our legal research. It was published uh, in Finland. Uh, it was printed in Finland uh, because it wasn't possible to find a publishing house in, in Russia. And uh, a great Finnish uh, film director, Aki Kaurismäki, helped us. Um, so he has become our official publisher of this book on, on Chechnya and international law. Then I, I continued to, to, to work as a journalist, uh, but I also become, uh, I also tried to connect Russian activists, Russian journalists, uh, Russian uh, NGOs with Finnish to find them some partners uh, in Finland. And uh, with the course of time, I became elected to the board of the Finnish Russian Citizens Forum. And uh, in 2010, um, on initiative uh, from, uh, from the EU, uh, there was established uh, the EU-Russia Civil Society Forum. And I'm also uh, a member of the steering committee uh, of this EU-Russia Civil Society Forum. So I continued to work uh, with their purpose to connect people from Russia with their uh, European partners. The research was launched at the European Parliament and it was also presented at the OEC 
and uh, Dick Marty uh, referred to our research in his recommendations uh, uh, on the in the special report on the North Caucasus for the European, uh, sorry, for the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. So it was, yeah, it was, it has been recognized. Okay. It is complex because all the, uh, the Baltic states, um, after gaining the independence, they can't be seen as a, um, as a, a entirely uh, and having entirely the same uh, political conditions. They are absolutely different from uh, from each other. So Estonia has uh, very little comparison with Latvia, and Latvia has very little comparison with Lithuania. But to start with, uh, it's very important. Uh, to go back to the history because I do remember the year of 1991 and uh, I was at that time I was in living uh, in, in Nizhny Novgorod it was my last year at the university and I do remember vividly these feelings over solidarity and support with people of the Baltic republics in their wish to become independent so it was the overall feeling of the majority of the Soviet people to let them go. So it was accepted as a, a matter of fact. We didn't have anything against that at all. I mean the majority of the Soviet people. It was the overwhelming pub public opinion that Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia have all right to go. Even then I knew that uh, uh, quite many Russian-speaking people living in these countries so they also supported this uh, independence movement. So what happened afterwards was uh, quite puzzling for me. I, 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 really, uh, I really couldn't understand uh, why people who felt the same and who belonged to the same society were not treated the same. Even uh, then it's necessary to be in mind that the political reality of uh, these three new countries uh, was still different. Uh, for instance, I, I, I started to closely watch uh, their situation in these countries in 2008. Actually, uh, also thanks to Finland, because I stayed in Finland and uh, I got more access to these countries. And I started to work in these countries as journalists on different issues, for instance, uh, since 2008, I worked in Lithuania as a journalist on a on particular case of a, a Chechen family who uh, came under fabricated charges in Lithuania. And now this family um, are refugees in, in Finland. In Latvia, it was, yeah, I, I also I pub I wrote a lot of articles on, on Latvia and um, on political reality in Latvia. And I regard, uh, in my estimation, uh, the most difficult situation with regard to inter-ethnic tension is in Latvia. Um, well, uh, Estonia, Estonia is different. Uh, for instance, also, uh, non, uh, they also have this institution of non-citizens but uh, uh, which was different from, from, from Latvia, for instance. Uh, Non-citizens of Estonia have the right to participate in the municipal elections, uh, which non-citizens of Latvia uh, are still fighting for. So they are deprived of even this possibility. And this is different for me because, you know, I, uh, with my experience of a Finnish non-citizen, I can have my own judgments. Even when I was living in Finland uh, with a Russian passport, I, and I was registered uh, as a resident of the municipality of Helsinki, even then with a the Russian passport, I had automatically the right to participate in the municipal elections. Not even to vote, but also to, if I wished, I had the possibility to, uh, to run for the municipal elections. So, and I am a non-citizen of Finland, but this status saves me from a lot of trouble 
because my Russian passport was uh, stolen and the Russian embassy refused to issue a new passport for me. So, and uh, for several months, I was without any documents. And the Finnish police proposed me to help me in this desperate situation to issue a Finnish passport of a non-citizen. So, and now I'm, I can compare. I've uh, been in the same, so to say, position with non-citizens of Estonia and of Latvia. I can compare that my status of a non-citizen of Finland actually improves my situation. It makes my situation safer, whereas these people who were born here, so this status uh, deprives them of possibility. For instance, non-citizens of Latvia, so they, uh, this uh, status allows them to travel uh, in the Schengen area, but they don't have a working permit which is different because ethnic Latvians who are citizens of Latvia, so they can go to any country and find a legal job for them. So there's uh, these, uh, uh, these non-citizens of Latvia, they are treated as kind of slave force because they are, uh, well, they are, uh, they are confined in, to Latvia and the only work abroad they can get is, uh, uh, is illegal. History nowadays has become a very, very powerful political tool. And uh, for me, this is a very dangerous development because hi history is such a sensitive area uh, that uh, the whole societies can be manipulated into a um, uh, distorted way of understanding the, the present. So there's uh, yeah, unfortunately, in order to justify um, this kind of attitude to ethnic minorities, unfortunately, yes, history has been used uh, to influence the public view. As, uh, as these uh, um, issues of uh, history and uh, collective memory are uh, such a big thing on the agenda of uh, uh, these countries, uh, I feel that it's uh, what is uh, what is missing is uh, individual is uh, collecting individual memories because very often um, individual stories uh, can come into contradiction with uh, their uh, once and for all accepted uh, notion of history because history is always made of uh, different kind of exceptions and role of uh, just individual peoples people uh, is, is crucial. Uh, one, one person act can influence their, could influence the course of events. So there's, uh, I feel that um, uh, what is, uh, yeah, there is quite a lot of effort uh, being put right now into um, analyzing the archives in establishing the memorial sites in uh, building museums. But, uh, for instance, uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen anywhere in the museums in this area any attempt uh, to present testimonies of uh, uh, people who were part of those histories. Uh, like I, for instance, saw in the Museum of, Indep of, uh, of the Resistance uh, in Warsaw, or in uh, the museum of Srebrenica in Sarajevo. Uh, and that's, that's extremely important uh, to keep and to record, uh, which, which, which is now not being done here. One of the possible explanations is that uh, these kind of personal stories are, uh, can contradict the official agenda. Finland is a very, um, also is, a, is another, s uh, so to say, sensitive area because of, uh, fin of Finland's uh, difficult relations and very complex relations with, with Russia. But uh, in Finland it's very interesting that uh, they don't uh, try to erase the past of the Russian Empire and uh, something good which uh, the Russian Empire brought 
to them. For instance, I when I um, when I uh, stayed to live in Finland, I was in the first year. I was really impressed with the uh, kind of acceptance of most Finns that uh, it was the Russian Empire which uh, uh, provided them with the possibility to develop their written language because the Swedes, under whom the Finns were, uh, they uh, tried to uh, keep them away from education because they were used as um, soldiers and uh, like labor force, but they were no educated Finns under the Swedes, uh, which was different uh, in Russia. Uh, when Finland became part of Russia. I was impressed with uh, the very simple fact that they still have uh, their streets named after uh, the Russian czars, like Alexander Rikatu, which is the street named after Alexander II, or uh, Lizankatu, which is the street named after uh, Queen Elizabeth the monument to Alexander I, the monument to Alexander II, or the memorial sites on the houses uh, where, Alexander, where the, the Russian Tsarist families members stayed in Finland. So they keep this kind of memory. They don't have anything against it. Well, uh, I, I, I do think that uh, it has nothing to do with history or with memory. This is politics. And this is contemporary politics. So uh, the, the whole thing was uh, initiated in order to influence uh, uh, the politics of current governments and uh, not to keep the memory or to study the history.